And now I would like to introduce today's speakers. Lindsay Fior is a partner in the Labor and Employment Practice Group. As an experienced trial lawyer, she defends employers against single and multi-plaintiff employment cases that include claims relating to age, race, disability discrimination, sexual harassment, hostile work environment, whistleblower allegations, and wage and hour issues. She also handles suits brought by the EEOC and has defended employers against unfair labor practice charges. Lindsay Davis is an associate in the firm's labor and employment practice group. Lindsay is committed to practical front end solutions to employer needs and comprehensive advocacy of client interests. Her practice covers a broad range of issues involving counseling, discipline, and discharge of employees, as well as state and federal employment discrimination law. She regularly represents clients in state and federal court, as well as before various administrative agencies. And now I'll turn it over to Lindsay. But which Lindsay? This one. Um, thank you for the introduction. <laughs> we like to call ourselves the Lindsay and Lindsay Show. Um, Thank you for joining us today. We're so happy to have you here. Just a brief um, overview of what we're going to be talking about today. Lindsay Davis is going to start by giving you all um, some of the background of the Me Too movement and the Time's Up movement and how those movements have um, made their way into the workplace and the effect that they've had um, on workplace environments and also the effect that they've had on the employment law world. Um, then I'm going to talk to you, once we've got you good and scared about all of the uh, concerns that are out there and what could possibly happen, I'm going to talk to you all about best practices for employers to avoid becoming a cautionary tale. Lindsay. Um, so as, as Lindsay mentioned, what we're going to start with is sort of an overview of how did we get here, what is the background. Um, on all of this, and then we'll segue into um, how you as organizations and companies can best prepare yourselves um, for allegations of sexual harassment. Um, so the starting point here is with what is called the Me Too movement. And I'm guessing by now, um, all of you have probably heard of, of this particular movement and the hashtag Me Too. Um, but in case you haven't, it's a viral social media campaign um, that's meant to demonstrate the widespread prevalence of sexual assault and sexual harassment. Um, it, the real prevalent use of this particular hashtag in social media um, followed the public revelations of numerous sexual misconduct allegations, in particular against Harvey Weinstein. Since then, which was back in about October of 2017, the phrase hashtag me too has been posted online millions of times, usually accompanied by a personal story of sexual harassment or sexual assault. Here are some examples of that and you'll see that in particular these examples illustrate that the me too movement has hit employers right so each of these examples are of different individuals. Um, really acknowledging in incidents of sexual harassment or sexual assault in their workplaces. To take an example, if you look at the first tweet there in the upper, what is my left corner, um, here's an example of an individual saying, my supervisor asked me to step into the bathroom so he could show me how to do the inventory. He pinned me against a wall, hashtag me too. Again, these are what three of um, really hundreds of thousands of examples of Me Too incidents happening in a workplace. Sort of parallel with this Me Too um, social media campaign is what is called the Time's Up movement. Um, the Time's Up movement is a movement, again, against sexual harassment um, fo founded by Hollywood celebrities in January of 2018. Again, this is really in direct response to um, a lot of the issues that were coming to the forefront regarding sexual harassment in, in Hollywood, basically. Um, the founding initiatives of this particular movement included 
um, starting a legal defense fund to support lower income women who were seeking justice for sexual harassment and assault, in particular in the workplace. Um, along with that, the Time's Up movement uh, has as one of its goals advocating legislation to punish companies that tolerate persistent sexual harassment. And we're going to talk about some of those uh, companies that have been in the headlines lately. Um, in addition, the Time's Up movement uh, has as a goal encouraging gender parity in studios and talent agencies. Um, you'll see on the slide, but I actually have an update for you that the Time's Up movement has raised more than $20 million for its legal defense fund, and it has actually gathered over 500 volunteer lawyers um, since its founding or since, since it's sort of became um, widely recognized there have been more than 1800 women who have asked for help from the Time's Up um, Legal Defense Fund and their volunteer attorneys. So I think the natural question would be, okay, so you're, you've told me about these um, initiatives, which are really Hollywood initiatives, right? Have they, have they actually had the impact of raising more awareness and how do they impact us as more everyday employers? Um, so the first thing I want to cover in this regard is to talk through with you the legislative impact of these movements. Um, one of the big things that came out of and was really closely timed with the Me Too and the Time's Up movements um, was what is known as the Tax Act, which became effective in December of 2017. Um, and this, you know, prior to the Tax Act, employers would deduct as ordinary and necessary business expenses um, settlement payments and legal defense fees. And what the Tax Act says is the government will no longer permit employers to deduct any settlement that's related to sexual harassment or sexual abuse or any related legal fees if the settlement includes a non-disclosure or confidentiality provision. Um, and for those HR reps or in-house legal individuals who are in the room, you know that almost every single time your settlement agreements include a non-disclosure or a confidentiality provision. And so you have to think now about um, how that changes or if you're willing to sort of forego any um, tax benefit that might be associated with uh, paying these settlements so that you can secure confidentiality. So you have, there's a tug of war there that you're going to have to be considering on a going forward basis. Um, in addition to this, Congress has introduced and in fact reintroduced as recently as February of 2019, legislation that would make it illegal for businesses to enforce arbitration agreements if employee allegations involve sexual harassment or gender discrimination. Um, this latest round of legislation is actually supported by attorney generals from all 50 states, um, the District of Columbia, and our territories. And um, large companies have sort of in the wake of Me Too and Time's Up um, ended their own practices of mandatory arbitration for these types of claims, including Uber, Microsoft, and Google. Uh, so this is a potential trend that I think is is starting to set in, and we'll have to see where this most recent uh, round of legislation goes, but know that major, major companies are making the move to not require arbitration for these types of claims. We talked about sort of what's going on on the federal level, but this is also obviously hitting on a state-by-state -state level as well. Um, many states have either proposed, proposed or in some cases adopted their own legislation relating to workplace sexual harassment. We focus here on these slides about the issues of confidentiality and arbitration, but know as well that lots of states have now taken the position that employers must, uh, as a matter of law, provide sexual harassment training and have gone so far as to prescribe what that training has to include. Um, it's possible that you're in one of those states, and so if you would like to talk about that, um, certainly don't hesitate to reach out to us. In addition to that type of mandatory training um, legislation, again, a lot of states are introducing and adopting um, their own legislation relating to confidentiality agreements. Most recently, Arizona, Tennessee, and Washington 
have actually enacted legislation that limits or outright prohibits the use of non-disclosure agreements relating to sexual harassment or sexual assault. In addition, the state of Vermont has enacted legislation that prohibits arbitration of sexual harassment claims. Um, and you can see, again, that there are other states out there that are trying to move forward in the same direction. We'll have to see where that legislation goes as well. In addition, uh, you know, what the statistics are telling us is that the Me Too and Time's Up movements have resulted in an actual uptick in sexual harassment claims being filed. Um, in particular, we know that employers' boots on the ground are reporting an upsurge in internal complaints of harassment in the wake of these movements. Um, but in addition to that, a recent report from a leading servicer of corporate compliance hotlines has also indicated that internal harassment complaints have increased by about 25% just in that time period of 2017 to 2018. Um, this obviously suggests to us a shift in employees' tolerance of sexual harassment. And in addition to that, I think um, an increased awareness in what types of behavior may rise to the level or be perceived as rising to the level of sexual harassment. Um, EEOC is reporting much the same. So as of October of 2018, they were reporting um, that sexual harassment charges filed with the EEOC had gone up 12%. This is actually pretty significant because it's the first time in about five years that there has been a noticeable uptick in sexual harassment um, claims. They are also telling us that visits to their sexual harassment website are up by 100%. Um, so that resource is obviously getting used a lot more um, in the wake of these movements as well. Um, what we're going to talk about next is the, the fact that these types of claims for sexual harassment and sexual assault can result in very significant um, monetary damages as well as, of course, reputational damages. And so I want to walk through with you some examples of that. I'm going to start back in Hollywood where it all began. Um, and so a couple of the sort of big cases or big incidents that came forward as part of this Me Too movement were first 21st Century Fox and Bill O'Reilly and second Fox News and Roger Ailes. So starting with Bill O'Reilly, um, in January of 2017, O'Reilly and Fox settled a claim of sexual harassment brought by a network analyst to the tune of $32 million. Um, and if you thought that was all there, um, this was actually the sixth settlement that uh, 21st Century Fox had entered into relating to Bill O'Reilly and his conduct. Um, despite knowledge of this real pattern of sexual harassment, 21st Century Fox then extended Bill O'Reilly's contract. Um, this, perhaps not surprisingly, resulted in some significant backlash um, with many advertisers pulling out and saying they didn't want to be part of Bill O'Reilly's shows. Um, and as a result of that, he was ultimately ousted. But um, I think if you were, at, were to add up all six settlements that 21st Century Fox had been involved in re regarding Bill O'Reilly, the number would not be one that you would want to see. Um, Fox News and Roger Ailes is, is a, similar, a similar tale, I would say. Um, in that case, it was a former broadcaster, Gretchen Carlson, that alleged that Ailes had sexually harassed her. Um, she's, when, when she refused to sleep with Ailes, per her allegations, her employment contract was not renewed. Um, she sued, and ultimately, she also received a multi-million dollar settlement, this time $20 million. Um, Ail subsequently resigned, but not before receiving a $40 million severance. Um, additional lawsuits against Ailes fo uh, followed this, and um, many of which I don't think have yet been resolved. Um, more recently than these two, if you've been sort of following the news on sexual harassment as I do, um, you may have seen that Google has been swept up in all of this as well. Um, and not to be a one-upper, uh, Google has paid two executives a total amount of $135 million um, in the midst of sexual harassment allegations, um, and that $135 million secured 
the separation of those executives, but as we'll talk about in a few slides, also resulted in some very significant backlash from Google employees. Let's step out of Hollywood for a moment and talk about how is this impacting, again, employers who aren't in California and dealing with uh, multi-million dollar contracts and famous faces. Um, it's not that much different, to be honest. So these types of cases very, very often can result in significant either court awarded damages or settlements. Um, I've highlighted just a few up here for you, probably the biggest being that $41 million award to a retail chain employee who had made numerous complaints that her manager was harassing her. And in that case, the, the plaintiff alleged that the employer ignored her many, many complaints until she was actually sexually assaulted by this manager. After that happened, she brought a lawsuit and again was awarded significant damages in that case. Now, the facts there are obviously horrific, and, and one would hope that none of you are ever involved in a case that gets to that level. But even if the end, end point of an interaction between an employer and an employee isn't sexual assault, that doesn't mean you're not still going to be looking at significant damages. And that's highlighted by the other three examples on the slide. As I promised you I would, I want to talk about some more recent and high profile um, lawsuits against employers. These ones kind of taking the approach of alleging um, fraternity or bro cultures. Um, the, I know there are a lot of lawyers in my room and maybe others listening, so probably we have been following the case involving Jones Day, um, which of course is, is one of the largest law firms in the world. Um, that, that case, which is pretty recently filed, um, is being filed as a class action and involves allegations that men were being groomed for partnership while women were not, and plaintiffs alleging that women were encouraged to wear high heels and to smile more and were referred to as eye candy. Um, women's support groups, as alleged in the complaint, were also mocked by male colleagues. So this is one of the pending lawsuits going on right now. The other, as we talked about, is that involving Google. Um, in that case, the plaintiff is claiming that Google enforced a bro culture where coworkers spiked drinks, regularly shot Nerf guns at her, asked her for horizontal hugs, and hid under her desk. Um, these types of lawsuits are ones that I, I think is safe to say every single employer wants to avoid. Um, and this is for a lot of reasons. Um, I think, again, because you face potential damages in the millions, um, millions of dollars range, but also because, as I think the picture hopefully represents, um, these types of lawsuits uh, often, no matter the outcome, really result in significant reputational harm to an employer. So that's why we're going to talk at the end of this presentation about what you all can do um, to encourage a culture of reporting and um, to sort of from on a top down basis um, establish that this type of behavior is not acceptable. I see that I, I sort of um, cut ahead here. So this is many of the points that we just talked about. Um, but again, recognize that these types of lawsuits, no matter the income, do result in serious reputational harm. Um, here we provide two pretty recent examples. Um, I think most recently is the Google one where actually 20,000 different employees stage a walkout um, due to the workplace bro culture uh, along the lines of that being alleged in the lawsuit that we just covered. Um, something similar happened fairly recently with McDonald's, um, where workers in six different cities um, had a one-day walkout, again, to protest what they perceived as rampant sexual harassment, which, like Google, is the subject of litigation. Um, in addition to sort of what might happen with your workforces, I think you also want to consider what impact these types of lawsuits have on consumers. Um, we know, uh, again, from anecdotal evidence that consumers are showing an increased willingness to outright boycott products or services if they disagree with the employer's values, including a perception um, by the consumers that the employer, the company, is tolerating um, sexual harassment in the workplace. 
Um, on top of that, the examples I previously provided illustrate that lawsuits or internal investigations often lead to executives having to step down um, amidst these allegations. And sometimes that's because the executives are alleged to have been directly involved. But I think more often it's because the executives are alleged to not have done a sufficient job to address workplace culture issues. Um, and those losses of executives are obviously extremely disruptive um, to any company. And I, I think something that has to be part of the considerations here as well. So the other sort of issue that comes up in the context of um, what impact has the Me Too and Time's Up movement had is this sort of suits alleging inadequate investigations. Um, we have a couple of, of examples of this. The first one here is, is a case involving the Metropolitan Opera Association. And in this case, top uh, company officials were notified of complaints against the plaintiff on numerous occasions. So what was happening here was that individuals were alleging that the plaintiff was engaging in workplace sexual harassment. Um, once the company was notified by the police of a sexual misconduct invest or a sexual misconduct allegation, the employer then launched its own investigation, ultimately firing the plaintiff, the, the alleged wrongdoer, um, in the midst of a social media scandal. And the plaintiff then filed his own suit, alleging that his prior employer had defamed him and claiming that he had been not been given a reasonable opportunity to respond to the accusations against him. Um, so it's, it's sort of this type of litigation where the alleged wrongdoer is saying, I have been vilified, I have been mistreated, and I wasn't given the opportunity to defend myself in the way that I was entitled to. Um, in that case, he's seeking $5.8 million in damages. There have been some updates on this case, um, including that the court recently ruled that the plaintiff would be permitted to proceed on one of his defamation claims. So some of the claims were dismissed, but actually one of these is being allowed to pr proceed, which either means that you're looking at the potential of a jury trial here, or um, again, one of these potential significant settlements. And we highlight these types of cases because as Lindsay Fiore is gonna cover in her half of the presentation, um, it is so important that employers have a solid system in place and a process for thoroughly investigating these types of allegations before taking any corrective action um, based on them. So this is another sort of similar lawsuit, this one involving PBS, um, home of Sesame Street and beloved by many, I think. Um, in this case, PBS investigated complaints of workplace misconduct against one of its talk show hosts. During its investigation, PBS did not inform the host of the names of the accusers or the specific allegations against him. And at the close of the investigation, PBS fired the host. Um, similar to the previous example, the host then filed a suit against PBS, alleging that the investigation was biased and in violation of the norms and procedures for conducting workplace investigations. Um, also similar to the last example, uh, right now, I, as best I can tell, two of the four claims brought by this plaintiff are being allowed to go forward. Two of them have been dismissed. Um, so with that, I am going to turn it back over to Lindsay Fiore to hopefully ease your mind about where we go from here. Thanks, Lindsay. This is a really tricky environment right now that employers are dealing with. Um, what we're going to talk about is sort of how to prevent sexual harassment in the workplace, how to recognize it, and how to appropriately respond to complaints that come in regarding harassment in the workplace. Um, and, you know, I, I was speaking with some of our live guests here um, beforehand, but it's worth mentioning that th these tips, um, they apply to discrimination and all sorts of harassment also. I mean, these are general best practices for how to avoid becoming, as I said before, an employment lawyer's cautionary tale. Um, number one, most important thing, is creating a culture of inclusion. Um, and that is often much easier said than done, and we recognize that. Um, here are some tips on how employers can, can make this happen. 
um, acknowledging that these movements exist, having a mechanism by which the employer has regular communications with employees to reiterate the commitment to preventing and addressing harassment in the workplace. Um, being aware, I mean, being here today is is number, you know, it's, it's on the list of like top five things to do, right? Because just being aware of these issues, how these movements are affecting employees, um, how these movements are affecting human resources personnel, how they're affecting managers, um, how they're affecting cultural perceptions, um, definitely gets you down the road. And as Lindsay mentioned before, this culture of inclusion comes from the top down, right? So in ensuring that your managers are well trained, that they're modeling good behavior, um, and that they're being good examples for the employees who, who are their direct reports. And also, of course, encouraging employees to come forward. Now, it gets tricky, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, because one of the um, repercussions of inclusion and encouraging reporting is that I've had a lot of clients now say, I'm getting reports all the time that are basically, Kevin looked at me funny, I'm being sexually harassed, you know, and what do I do with that? Um, and we'll get into some of that in a minute, but, you know, being aware that this may result in an increase in complaints, is, which can be, um, can sometimes be a, a burdensome, not burdensome, but can often add to the workload, especially for management and human resources personnel. Important that all complaints are taken seriously. Um, not every complaint needs the same level of attention, um, but they should all be taken seriously and investigated thoroughly, and that's um, what we're gonna talk about in a little bit as well. Second thing on the list, review and revise your policies. I hope that every employer who is represented in this room has an anti-harassment policy. If not, you should let us know. We're happy to help with that. But um, there are some key things that ought to be in that policy for it really to be effective. Definition of sexual harassment, harassment generally also. Um, examples of what conduct is prohibited. The, I also advise clients when you're defining sexual harassment, a lot of them will just cut and paste what's on the EEOC website, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but that's where the examples really come in because not there's varying levels of sophistication among employees in the workplace, and you want your line-level employees to be able to understand what is and isn't appropriate in the workplace the same way that a C-suite person would be able to understand it. So having those examples can be really helpful. Although I also tell employers all the time, make sure that you are clear in the policy that these are examples and they're not, it's not an inclusive list and that there are things we couldn't even think of. Um, in the Google case that Lindsay was talking about, the coworker that hid under the plaintiff's desk allegedly, um, the, the allegations were that she went on a break, she came back from her break, she found her coworker hiding under her desk, totally freaked her out, and she's like, what are you doing? And he says, you'll never know, and takes off, and leaves her with the impression that he had put some kind of surveillance device in there or something. Like, that is an example of inappropriate behavior that is so specific, it's not gonna make it to your list of examples. Um, so making sure that it's clear that these are not, this is not the only, you know, type of conduct that is prohibited. Um, having a reporting procedure for employees who feel as though they've been sexually harassed or that they have observed sexual harassment. And then the policy should also have a statement against retaliation. Um, you know, making it clear to employees that we are not going to take adverse action against you if you come forward. And if something ever happens in res response to you coming forward, you know, you have a mechanism for also reporting that. The definition of sexual harassment, there's two types. It's good to have both examples in your policies. Um, there's hostile work environment, sexual harassment, and there's quid pro quo. Quid pro, quid pro quo is sort of what we thought about in the 70s, 80s, maybe even 90s, sort of the sleep with me and I'll get you this promotion um, sort of sexual harassment. And it's easy to define, it's easy to spot. We all know what that is. Hostile work environment is a little bit different. That is more like repeated, severe, and pervasive conduct that ultimately rises to a level that makes the work environment abusive and hostile. I know it's, def 
the word is defined by itself. So that can be <laughs> uh, problematic at times, but that's why, you know, additional definitions and examples are helpful. Um, sexual harassment is unwelcome conduct of a sexual nature that has an adverse impact on an employee's job. Um, unwelcome can mean to the recipient or to others, meaning um, it's not just is it unwelcome to the person who is involved in that conversation. It could be unwelcome to someone who's just listening to it. And I've had cases, several actually and recently, where nothing happened to the plaintiff. She's sitting there working at her desk. In one case, she's sitting there working at her desk, and she's right outside the break room. And she hears employees talking to each other about really lewd sexual acts. And she, uh, she's not even in the same room as them. She's not part of that conversation, but she's right there, and she can hear it all. And it's upsetting and troubling to her to hear her coworkers speak that way. Um, so being aware that even though the coworkers in that conversation apparently welcomed that that conduct, you know, she didn't. Um, and so that's what we mean when we say to the recipient or to others. Um, conduct, conduct of a sexual nature can be a lot of different things. It can be emails, it can be photographs, it can be, you know, those silly memes that people make now that go around. Um, it can be jokes, it can be making offensive comments, it can be propositioning someone, it can be talking about your sex life in front of someone else. It can be asking someone else about their sex life. And then, of course, the physical stuff. But it's important for a policy to lay these things out because a lot of, I think a lot of employees, or any, just generally people in the public, and maybe this, this is part of the culture shift, but when we think of sexual harassment, we think of touching. And we used to, as employment lawyers, it used to be very common in response to sexual harassment allegations to always make this argument, there was no touching here. Is this really harassment? You know, all he did was make these comments. He didn't even touch her. And that, that used to fly as a, a decent defense. Um, I think there's problems with that defense now. Um, and, and especially as the Me Too movement, you know, becomes adopted um, in the regular workplace. But it's not just physical, and that's important to keep in mind. And then, for something to rise to the level of sexual harassment under the law, um, it needs to have an adverse impact on the employee's work environment. And that can mean either, um, you know, resulting in that employee not getting a promotion, resulting in that employee um, feeling like he or she has to quit because the environment is just so hostile that he or she can't handle being there and a reasonable person would be forced to quit. So it, it's it's a higher bar to get to what sexual harassment means under the law. But the important thing is to remember is that isolated or trivial incidents, they don't necessarily mean that, they don't necessarily qualify as sexual harassment under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act or you know, any state discrimination law. But they are still actions that should be prohibited by the workplace and should be recognized and should be addressed when they happen. Mainly, I mean, there's a lot of just different reasons for that, of course, but knowing that these isolated or trivial, trivial incidents eventually can lead to something else. And if isolated, trivial incidents are allowed or put up with or ignored, um, I mean, you give someone an inch, they take a mile, right? Another important point to make in your policies is that harassment can be per per perpetrated by anyone, regardless of their gender, their gender identity, their sexual orientation. It is not boss man sexually harassing female secretary anymore. And that's sort of our traditional thought of it. Um, I had a case recently where, and this kind of ties into what I was talking about a minute ago, but the allegations in the, in the case were that the plaintiff, a woman, um, was alleging sexual harassment against her boss, also a woman, and not because she had acted sexually towards her, but because, according to the complaint, the boss, the manager, was constantly talking about her sex life with employees. And in graph allegedly in graphic detail, um, and made the employee very uncomfortable having to hear that. And it, it, this is, 
this is a woman alleging sexual harassment against another woman, and it's not even, you know, sexual in the way that we think about it. So um, these, these claims come from all different angles. Harassment can be perpetrated by non-employees. As an employer, you are responsible for ensuring a sexual harassment-free workplace. And that means vendors, independent contractors, customers. Um, the biggest mistake that an employer can make is they're not my employee, I can't do anything about it. It's not true. There are often lots of ways to resolve these issues. But you know, if the guy who comes in and, and stocks the Coke machine is acting inappropriately toward the, the employees who work near, in that area, and the employees report it, the employer does have an obligation to do whatever they can to address and fix the situation. And harassment can include off-duty conduct, also important to recognize. Saying, well, it happened at a party and it wasn't at work, doesn't mean that the manager, you know, kissing an employee who doesn't want to be kissed, that there's no repercussions for that. Because as you all know, things that happen outside of the workplace make themselves right into the workplace very easily. Um, I, was th I was talking to you earlier about, you know, how important it is to have examples of prohibited conduct, obvious examples and not so obvious examples, um, and especially given this sort of culture shift that we're going through. I don't know if any of you, you know, if you follow the news and you've been following what's happened with Joe Biden lately, um, I think this is a really good sort of timely example of this, but there have been women that have come forward and said, he's he's, you know, sort of touched me or interacted with me in, an, in a way that made me feel uncomfortable. Not that he assaulted them, but that he just made them feel uncomfortable um, by rubbing their shoulders or hugging them when they don't necessarily want to be hugged. These are actions that I think 30 years ago, nobody batted an eye about. Today, there's clearly a shift in how people feel about being touched without, <laughs> without express consent. Um, and so, you know, rubbing a coworker's shoulders when they don't ask you to, or, you know, being that person who hugs people um, as part of your primary form of communication or, you know, as a m method of endearment um, can be offensive to some people. And, you know, and Joe Biden, he put this video out and he basically said, look, this is how I communicate with people. I am a people person. This is how I make connections. You know, I, ha I don't mean anything by it. It's not sexual. It's this is how I, you know, this is how I connect with people and my constituents. And certainly understandable when he, from his perspective, but that's sort of the point here and why we're all here today, which is that line of thinking has changed. And what people feel comfortable with now has changed. Um, in, in, you know, in his political career. So I've listed some examples here. Um, and this, again, is not, it's not an exclusive list. There are many, many other examples. But things that are not so obvious, you know, rating a person's looks, asking an employee about their sex life. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be overtly sexual for it to be problematic. And the defined reporting procedure is also a very important part of the policy. And this is really just the employees need a person that they can report to or an anonymous hotline is also great to have. Um, somebody other than the person who is doing the, the alleged bad act, right, or acts. Um, if an employee only has one person or um, job title to report concerns to, then if that person is the one that they're concerned about, they have no options. So always have two, at least two options for employees. The more the better, because the idea is you want to encourage employees to report this stuff because it gives the, it gives the employer obviously a chance to address it and fix it. And the longer it goes on without an employee feeling like he or she, you know, has the ability to report it or not comfortable reporting it, you know, these behaviors escalate and they can turn into something much worse than they were when they started. And then finally, a statement against retaliation, which I spoke about earlier, just making sure that employees understand that they will not be retaliated against for bringing complaints forward and then and that any concerns of retaliation will obviously also be thoroughly addressed and taken seriously.
What else? You've got a policy. It's thorough. You've got an inclusive environment. You've got a great culture. Now what? Having a great policy with all of those points that we just went through is hugely important, but it lacks punch if employees don't know where it is, what it is, if that it even exists, or if they don't understand it. And that's where the next piece of this comes in, which is training. Train, 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 and train some more, as we say. Um, annually, if you can. Training is really important, in, ideally in person. A lot of employers also have these modules on the computers that employees can sort of go through and they have to watch a video and answer questions. Anything that can be interactive is more likely going to land with the people who are being trained. I actually do training in three different groups, and I recommend this for employers. The human resources personnel who are going to be investigating complaints, they get their own training. Managers who are going to be hearing these on the front lines, seeing things that are inappropriate, hearing about it, they get their own training. And then the line level employees, they get their own training as well. Every one of those groups has a different role in preventing, recognizing, and addressing harassment in the workplace. And I found that tailoring the training to the different groups makes it more effective. Investigate your complaints, not your complaints, investigate employee complaints swiftly and thoroughly. Um, investigate every complaint, as I said before, promptly and thoroughly. Practice good documentation and practice good communication. And I'm going to go through what all of these things mean. Investigate every complaint. I, that's now, I think, the third or fourth time I've said that, so I'm going to just push that. And it's tough, right? Because you get the boy or the woman who cried wolf, the man or the woman who cried wolf. You get serial complainers. Everyone who worked, I guarantee everyone listening or to this presentation who works in HR has someone who complains about everything. You have to be very careful not to distrust the complaint because it's a, coming from a person who complains about everything. Um, eventually, the serial complainer will get it right. And establishing that every complaint will be taken seriously goes a long way in also um, sort of reiterating the culture that you're trying to create that this, this stuff is not allowed in the workplace and it, it will be addressed appropriately. Um, and so remember, of course, that not every complaint is worth the same investigation. And when I say investigation, I don't mean Let's call in a third party, you know, investi HR investigation company or, or outside counsel and do a three day thing where every single employee is interviewed. Not every complaint, I mean, some complaints do warrant that. Not every complaint does. Sometimes investigating is as simple as let me call this person who you say looked at you funny and figure out what's going on. And maybe there's just a personality conflict there that can be resolved. I mean, investigation can be as simple as that. Um, but doing nothing is where um, employers run into problems. Failing to investigate can have serious repercussions. Escalating behavior, as I've mentioned before, there is the, the possibility that it damages the culture that you all are trying so hard to create of inclusion and, and thorough investigations. And this middle one is really, from a lawyer's standpoint, it's the big one. Um, the very, one of the great I don't want to use the word great. That's one of the best defenses an employer can have to a sexual harassment or any harassment lawsuit is that as soon as we found out about it, we did a thorough, a prompt, thorough, and impartial investigation, and we took appropriate action. That is, with, uh, with a few exceptions, that is, generally speaking, a complete defense, um, especially to a claim where nothing has happened to the person. So if someone's been fired and they're claiming it was for sexual harassment, like a quid pro quo thing, that's a little bit of a different situation. But if it is peer to peer, he's treating me this way, she's doing this to me, those claims get knocked out if the employer takes appropriate action. So that is why it is so important to do it. And as you will see, courts have found that delaying as little as a month 
was not a sufficiently prompt investigation and could uh, warrant punitive damages. So investigating promptly and thoroughly means a few things. Obviously acknowledging the complaint, letting the employee know that you've heard what they're saying and that you take it seriously. Figure out who is the best person to investigate. If you have in-house HR, that's always the best, um, the best option. Sometimes HR is the, someone in HR is the person being complained about and then you have to think about what are alternatives. Um, but at a minimum, you want the investigator to be someone who is not involved in the situation. If someone comes and claims that their manager is sexually harassing them and then the manager is the investigator, that kind of defeats the entire purpose. Sounds obvious, but you'd be surprised that this, this sometimes gets messed up. Um, and you want the person who's doing the investigation to have had the training um, to do an appropriate investigation. The complainant, I, I usually advise clients, interview the, the complaining person first. Oh, there's a question. This is exciting. Okay, I'm gonna, I am going to um, thank you for your question. I will address that at the end of the presentation. Um, but I think it's a great question. I advise, I advise employers to, um, Did we lose sound? Okay, all right. Um, I advise employers to um, interview the complainant first and get all of the detail about what, what all the allegations are, as much detail as you can, and sometimes you have to go back to them a couple of times. Um, but get your bullet points of what you need to investigate. And then um, determining who the appropriate witnesses are, obviously interviewing those people, interviewing the alleged bad actor, um, creating, you know, document, documenting the interview of everybody and preserving it, maintaining it, keeping it in a separate file, and then sometimes preparing a report depending on the situation. Um, practice good documentation, as we say, for the love of your lawyers. Remember your documents may be exhibits someday. And those of you who have had the misfortune of being involved in any kind of employment harassment or discrimination claim that made it to court will know it can take years. I have a case right now that was filed. It's a 19 plaintiff discrimination case filed in the Bronx in October of 2011. And we're probably a year and a half to two years away from trial still. The people involved in that, I guarantee you, if, we, if they had not written out, if that HR director had not written out her interview notes, there is no way she's going to remember who said what and why she did what she did. Those notes are so important. Um, we don't, I know that nobody wants to think uh, this might end up in a lawsuit someday, and it's really hard to put that frame of mind, um, to put yourself in that frame of mind, because those of us who work in the legal world we see everything as a potential lawsuit. People who work in, in the business world don't, and it can be to your peril to think that everything might become a lawsuit. So it makes sense, but keeping good documentation is super important, just even for your own records, even for if this person comes back in a year and says, since I made that complaint, these three things have happened. You may not even remember what the initial complaint was if there isn't documentation of it. So very important for, for the investigating person to keep good documentation. And there's just some, some other tips here about, you know, what good documentation means, contemporaneous notes, you know, not adding your own um, sort of perceptions of what happened, just sticking to the facts, making sure you have an accurate record of the date and the time and who was in the interview or in the room. And lastly, practice good communication. This goes so far in alleviating an employee's concerns. Um, the first part is don't overpromise confidentiality to employees. In a sexual harassment case, it's just not, it, it can't happen. You're lying if you tell them everything you say will be completely confidential. And the reason is the person who's the alleged accuser or the alleged harasser has, an, has a right, I guess a right, to respond to the allegations against him or her. As Lindsay was talking to you all about the PBS case and the Metropolitan Opera case, 
But in both of those cases, the problem was, or the alleged problem was, that the person who had been accused of these things never had an opportunity to respond. A thorough investigation cannot take place unless the person who's alleged to have been a bad actor has the chance to say, that happened, this didn't happen, well, that sort of happened, but let me give you the whole story. So telling an employee who complains that, that their complaints will be completely confidential is not true. Obviously, you want to uh, ease their concerns. You don't want a workplace full of gossip about what's happening. It's a need-to-know basis. And what, what I advise employers to tell employees in that situation is, look, I can't promise complete confidentiality. I have to do an investigation. I'm now legally obligated to do an investigation because you told me that this happened to you. But I can tell you that, that um, the witnesses will be told to keep these things confidential and that we will not share the details of your complaint with anyone outside of those people who need to know to allow us to do our investigation. And then don't keep the complainant guessing. At the end of the day, when all is said and done, telling the complainant what happened, not in specific details, but saying, we've, we've investigated, your complaints are substantiated or not substantiated, and we have taken appropriate action. A lot of times employees get ticked off because they want to know exactly what happened, like what does appropriate mean? And sometimes it means you gave a written warning to the alleged person. Sometimes it means you just redid harassment training for everybody. Sometimes they'll know because the person gets fired or they have to go to the training too. Sometimes they won't know what happened. I don't advise employers to give specifics. I mean, personnel matters are private and you set a really, you set a bad precedent if you tell employees, you know, what you've done to, to specifically to address their complaints. But having the communication that something has been done, that, that an investigation has happened and that action has been taken um, can certainly go a long way. Okay, questions. Is there somebody in the live audience that had a question? Oh. I've got a few that have come in through the um, through the webinar here that I will. Okay. If you have a question, oh, okay, okay. If you have a question, just let us know. Um, Okay, here's, here's a, I've got a few here and I'm going to run through them quickly and then we've got um, a couple scenarios that we'll go through as examples if we have time, but one person asked me if there are recordings of the harassment, is it admissible in court? Great question. I would say in 90% of the cases I have right now, of all kinds of employment discrimination cases, there's a recording of some kind. It's so easy to push a button on your phone. The answers to whether it's admissible in court is it depends. Um, it depends on whether the plaintiff was part of the conversation and can, can authenticate that it happened. It depends on whether it has anything to do with the claims at issue. Um, it, de it depends on a lot of things, but we all operate under the presumption that they probably will be. We also advise employers to have policies that prohibit recording in the workplace um, for, for this reason and for other reasons, um, especially employers that have that are healthcare employers where HIPAA is a concern, or um, you know there are FAA regulations, or you know a, a, who knows what other kinds of. There's probably hundreds of federal regulations that would cause a concern, um, but certainly to protect confidential information as well, trade secrets, business information, um, having a policy that prohibits prohibits recording in the workplace can be really helpful in preventing employees. And then, I mean. In this day and age, I also tell human resources people when they're doing investigations, ask the employee, are you recording this? If they say yes, say, I don't, I don't agree. I don't agree to be recorded. Please turn it off. Um, but, you know, employees are getting sneakier these days. They've got pens with recording devices or they've got their phone in their pocket and you can't see it, whatever. Um, you have to be told that you have to disclose that you're recording, correct or no? For those who couldn't hear, the question was, does the person have to disclose that they're recording? It depends on the state, but no. In Arizona, it's a one-party recording state, meaning that, you know, anybody could, if I'm 
if I'm sitting there talking to anyone and I know I'm recording and they don't, it's legal. So employees will lie as well. I mean, you have to be prepared for that. Um, but for those it, in but the room, aware. for those in the room in Milwaukee, we are Wisconsin is also a one-party recording or one-party uh, uh, approval state for recording voice recording. Mm -hmm. Um, another question that came in that is a really great question. Here's the situation. An employee comes forward with a complaint about inappropriate behavior outside of the workplace. The accused claims nothing happened and the accuser has no complaints about the accused in the workplace. Besides reiterating the harassment policy, what else can an employer do? I had a case that involved almost this exact situation that we went to a two week federal court trial in last year. <coughs> the, the answer again, as most employment answer, law questions answers are, is it depends. Um, an investigation should still be done. That is, that's sort of the bottom line there. Um, and it sounds like in this situation that's sort of presumed, but just talking to the complainant and just talking to the accused is probably not gonna end the investigation if there are witnesses. Um, in the case I had, it was a manager who had allegedly come on to his direct report at a party outside of work that had nothing to do with work. Um, and when there's a, when there's a, a power dynamic there, um, certainly there's an obligation to look into it because again, and in that case, the, the scenario was the same. The, the accuser had no issue with his manager in the workplace, but this thing had happened and it permeates the workplace relationship. It's going to, there's no way around it. And the situation that was described in this, in this um, question is that it's the same thing, regardless of it's a manager and a direct report or if it's two colleagues, if someone feels that someone they work with has done something inappropriate to them outside of the workplace, that feeling comes back into the workplace and it's gonna affect everything. It's gonna affect how that relationship works. It's gonna affect how comfortable the employee who feels that something inappropriate has happened to him or her um, does their job even. It can affect productivity. I mean, it affects the workplace in a lot of different ways. So beyond, beyond re reiterating the harassment policy, I would do an investigation and find out what happened. Because if that employee did something inappropriate, even though it happened outside of the workplace, there needs to be some kind of communication to that employee that what happened is not okay. Susie, there's a question in Chicago. Hey, so, sure. So um, can you uh, make some recommendations regarding preserving attorney-client privilege? Can, can Lindsay you? Davis, you wanna take that one? Yeah, sure, I can take that one. Thanks, thanks for the question, it's a good one. Um, I, I think, you know, you have to sort of be careful about the attorney-client privilege issue. Um, probably the best way to preserve privilege, if that's your goal, um, is to have, is to consider having the investigation conducted by outside legal counsel. Um, but I do think that you want to really be thinking about the privilege issue in the context of sexual harassment in particular, because as Lindsay talked about previously, um, one of the potential defenses to a sexual harassment claim is for an employer to be able to present proof that they conducted a prompt and thorough and impartial investigation and that they took any necessary and appropriate remedial action. And it becomes um, complicated and, and more difficult in some cases to be able to demonstrate that if your investigation and all of the information gathered pursuant to that investigation was done under attorney-client privilege. So I, I think it's a very nuanced question. In some circumstances, you may decide that it's appropriate to do the investigation under privilege. I think if I were to have to say in most circumstances, um, I think you probably don't want to do an investigation under privilege, but it's really going to be fact specific. Um, and if ever you're facing that question as an employer, um, you may want to just bounce it off your outside legal counsel for, for some advice on how to proceed. But the, um, Oh, just, go ahead. Just a quick, quick follow up. But the employer can waive the privilege. So, you know, you can, you can have the privilege and then decide I will disclose, so you kind of have the best of both worlds. 
Yeah, you're absolutely right that it, it is the employer's privilege. And so if you were to get into the context of litigation and want to um, be able to prove up um, that defense that we were talking about, you could make the decision to waive privilege. But again, I think you have to be very thoughtful about what that will mean and how, how wide and far it extends. Um, there's a question in Milwaukee, so we're going to take that real quick. Just the last follow-up. I'm not a litigator. I'm not an employment lawyer. I could be wrong about this, so experts should comment. I was a participant in an investigation with a colleague, and one of the things my litigator colleague was very careful about in all of the interviews was to set the stage that he was um, – a lawyer for the company mm -hmm. that was doing this investigation, uh, although the expectation was that the uh, interview might be kept confidential, it was in fact up to the employer to make those decisions and any privilege belonged to the employer. We were not the lawyer of the interviewee and they needed to know that mm -hmm. before we started asking questions. Yeah, I think those are really important considerations, um, particularly in the circumstance where outside counsel or, or even inside counsel are in, uh, conducting these investigations. You want to be very clear about who you are, who you represent, and what your role is in the process. Yeah, that's actually um, a good topic for an entire additional <laughs> seminar. Um, we could talk for an hour about the privilege concerns that come up when companies do internal investigations. We are just a couple minutes over, so unless, does anyone else have any other questions? And we can hang around to take any questions too if you wanna ask one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, everybody, for coming and for attending the webinar. We appreciate it. Thank you.